My name is Sarah Lewis, and I'm one of the well-being coaches here at Palm. And this is a workshop called Setting Smart Goals. And this is a workshop that I've given a few years in a row now. And I find that it can be a very helpful way to think through a new year. Um, and what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be setting smart goals, as it says in the title. But more than that, we're going to have an opportunity to think through the different areas of your life and to think through how and why you're setting the goals that you're setting to ideally walk away with an expanded perspective on what goal setting looks like and how it can be useful in your life. So if you didn't hear before, it really is a workshop. You're going to have some time to do some work. So make sure that you have a writing utensil, make sure you have some paper, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. So why is it important to think about goal setting? What we're going to be looking at here is not just goal setting itself. It's not just how to set a goal, but also talk about why it's important to think about the goals that you're setting. And this is because the goals that we set are the actions that we're putting into place in our lives. And as we can see in this Gandhi quote, I have to minimize myself to see it. Your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. And so what that's saying is that the intentions that you have for yourself in your life end up guiding the actions that you put into place. Those actions become habitual, and those habits are what are going to take you through life. They're what essentially define you. And so goal setting is important because when you set a goal, you're making a statement about who you want to be and what you want your life to look like. And so it's important to, yes, know how to set a goal, but it's also important to think about the goals that you're setting and think about what's most important to you so that when you're setting your goal, it's connected to something meaningful. And we'll talk about this a lot more in the workshop. Okay. So this is a graph that serves as a background to what we're talking about. It's a graph of three character traits from the TCI, which is a temperament and character inventory, which is a personality test that we use at Palm to look at well-being. And what we're looking at here, you can see on a graph, there's these capital letters and these lowercase letters, and these are indicating whether someone is high or low in a given trait. And the trait that I'm interested in today and that we're essentially talking about today is this trait of self-directedness. And you can see self-directedness is that capital S. And if you look at this graph, the higher the bar, the more satisfied the person is with life, the better their health measures and the better their sense of social satisfaction. So if you look at the graph there, the one consistent variable is a capital S. And that means that self-directedness, being high in self-directedness, is related to being more satisfied in your life, to having better health and a better social network. And the way that we're going to define self-directedness is the ability to regulate and adapt behavior to the demands of a situation in order to achieve personally chosen goals and values. And so what that means is it's not just the setting of a goal. Self-directedness is that sense that you're living a goal-oriented life, a goal-driven life, that you're living a life that you are in control of and that you are defining for yourself. And so goals are really just the tools or the stepping stones of a self-directed life. But what's most important is that sense and developing that. And you develop self-directedness by deciding who you want to be, deciding where you want to go, and taking action on it. So the way that I'm going to define a goal here is in three parts. We have the what in the lower left, where you're headed. So this is the, when we usually talk about goals, this is what we talk about. What is your goal? I want to work out more. I want to cut back on sugar. That's your what. But we're also going to talk about the why and how today. The why is, as I've been saying, extremely important. The why is what is the personal significance of this goal to you and to your life? And if that is not present, 
it's often the reason that we don't follow through on the goals that we set for ourselves. If we don't really get to the heart of that, if we don't connect to it, then that goal is something that doesn't really hold meaning for us and we're not gonna stick with it. So it's important to think about that. We're actually gonna start with the why. The how are the ways you're going to get there. And this is also very important. This is the smart part of the presentation because without the how, you know where you wanna get, you may even know why you wanna get there, but you don't have a sense of how you're gonna do it. So we'll talk through all three. Let's start by thinking about what's because it's the most common way that we think about and talk about goals. So here is a list of America's top New Year's res resolutions from 2021 from the internet. Um, as you can see, it's exactly what you'd expect. And I've had, I've done this for three years and every year I pull up that year's New Year's resolutions and they are always the same. Exercising is always the top one. Eating healthier is always somewhere in the next two or three. We have losing weight, we have spending less money, less time on social media, reducing stress on the job actually is a new one, um, which I think makes sense in the climate of this last year. Quit smoking, cut down on alcohol. So, you know, there are goals that you would expect and they're good goals. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these goals. The question I have is why is America setting the same goals year after year after year, what that indicates to me is that for some reason, we're not taking action on them. And the other thing I wanna point out here is that these goals are very material in nature and that will become more clear in a moment. But what I mean by that is that they're focused on the body, they're focused on money. Um, and in fact, that's the majority of it. There's a little bit about relationships but for the most part, it's what I consume or don't consume, what I spend or don't spend. And again, nothing wrong with that area for goals, but there's so much more that we could be looking at and thinking about when we set goals. And I think sometimes people feel defeated because this is the only area that we think about when we think about setting goals. And what I wanted to do today is to think about all of life as being a space from which we can draw inspiration for goal setting. And I'm gonna walk you through that step-by-step step in this workshop to give you an opportunity to think about these different areas of your life. At the end of that, you may come back to exercising more. It may still be your top one, but you'll at least have gone through the process of thinking about all those different areas. So we're gonna expand the possibilities. So as I said, what I wanted to do today is start with a why. And from the why, we're gonna generate the what. And then once we know what the what is, we're going to generate the how. So if the what is a destination, the why is the what is it cause you to get out the map in the first place and want to find it. And to do that, I'm going to have you think through your personal values. So I'm just going to let you know that this exercise we're about to do is going to be far too quick to do with great depth. This is something that you could, and I would encourage you to do so, spend a lot of time on. We don't have the time today to really dig into it, but what I'm hoping this serves as is a model of thinking about your life and thinking about goal setting and self-directedness in your life, thinking about the areas of your life, so that if you want to take it further, you could always watch this presentation again because it's being recorded, or you can engage in some of the services that we offer at Palm to help dig into what this might help you start to look at. So as you'll see, whew, this is a really big chart of values, and I don't expect you to read the whole thing. The reason that I have this up is to just Prime you to think about what values are. And so values are our personal, personally chosen um, guiding principles, if you will, for our lives. And this is something that is going to be very individual to each person. And that ultimately is self-defined. And as I said in the beginning with that self-directedness, what makes a goal so satisfying is when it comes from you. 
And so what I want you to do is just take a moment here to start looking over this list and thinking about as you read through them, okay, what are the ones that are jumping out at you that feel like they're speaking to you personally? And again, you're not gonna be able to read through all of them. So maybe start in the R's or the S's or the G's or wherever it might be, but you're priming yourself, you're priming your brain to be in a situation to think about values and think about your values. Right, and as you're thinking about that, you can probably feel this values help you get at who you are and who you wanna be. And it's that that we're really looking at when we're talking about goal setting and self-directedness. So, now that I've given you a little bit of time to reflect, I'm gonna take that screen away and the next five slides, it's going to be up to you to spontaneously come up with your values in a given area of life. But don't worry, you don't need this sheet to do that, right? And somewhere in you, you already know this. You already know that empathy or perseverance or whatever it might be is important to you. So I'm gonna take it away and encourage you to now really start drawing from your own life and your own intuition about these things. So what we're going to do, and I'm encourage you to listen before you read the slide, um, is we're going to go through five areas of life and I'm using a structure from the Anthropedia Know Yourself Wellbeing Coaching Series that we use here at Palm. And in each of these domains of life, you're gonna be asked the same three questions. So what we're doing in this part of the workshop is you're going to sit down and really, I'm gonna encourage you to be as honest with yourself as you can be. Think about or let yourself create a mental snapshot of this area of your life and describe it to yourself, no matter what it looks like. You know, the, the strengths and the weaknesses, things that are going well, things that aren't going well. So as you can see, we're gonna start with partnership and family life. So, romantic partnership, family life. I want you to think about how you're living this part of your life right now in no more than three sentences. You're gonna take a moment to write that down or to really think about it. And as you're doing this, think about how it's going from the sense of what how are you engaging with it? So this drops down to question number three and I'll bring it up now just globally. As we go through this whole thing, it's really important to think about what you are bringing to a situation and what you can control. Because where we tend to get bogged down is when we feel like we're in a fight or we're out of control. For example, people in our lives aren't treating us a certain way or someone isn't pursuing something in their life that we wish they were pursuing, or something isn't going the way that we want it to be going, but it's, we have no control over it. I want you to think about what are you bringing to the table in this area of your life? And what does it, what does it look like from that perspective? So that's why I wrote, describe how you are living this part of your life your relationships, your family, and your relationships, your partner. Okay. So once you've thought about that, then I want you to take a moment and just think about what are your values? So using some of those words that we just looked at, what are your values in this domain of your life? You're going to list at least three. And again, with values, they're just words, they're adjectives or nouns, they're words that describe what is most important to you in this area of your life. Is it? Well, I was going to give you examples, but I don't want to bias anybody. So drawing it from your own self. 
So then once you've thought about how you're living that part of your life and you've looked at the values that you've written down in that part of your life, what I want you to do is look at how those two things interact. So in a sense, what you're trying to figure out are, is are you living this aspect of your life, your relationship to your family, your relationship to your partner, in line with the values that you have for yourself with who you want to be in that part of your life? And I'm going to talk about this a lot in coming slides, but as we do this work in awareness, it would be almost impossible that you get through all five slides and you go, yeah, 100 percent. I'm, you know, crushing it and knocking out of the park. Every single aspect of my life is in line with my values. It's unlikely that that's the case. Um, and so if you're finding that's not the case, that is perfectly OK. And it means you're being honest with yourself. And it means there's room to continue to grow. And actually, that's where the satisfaction comes in, is in moving towards those things. So as we go through this, I'll encourage you to be honest, but also to be self-compassionate as you're being honest with yourself. So as you look at your values, you look at how you're living this part of your life, just think about what, what changes come to mind that you could make to bring that part of your life more in line with your values. And it may be something huge and maybe something tiny, something as small as making more phone calls. But thinking about what changes you have control over. So not your partner becoming a better listener, your partner, you know, whatever it is, think about what changes you can bring to the table to bring more of what you value into your life. Okay, so again, this might be going more quickly than you would want. Like I said, you could spend a long time just in this part of life really digging into this and thinking about it, but we are going to move on because we have an hour to do a lot of work together. So next slide is your material life. So material life, by that, like I mentioned that first slide on um, America's goals for 2021, I really mean anything related to the tangible. And we're considering finances and money as part of that because it's, it's something that allows us to buy goods. It's, it's, um, we're considering it material. So as you think about your material life, think about how are you living your relationship to your body, to your health, to your finances, to your possessions, everything concrete. And it may be as you do this, that you decide to focus more on your body, more on your health, more on your finances, it's whatever is coming up for you at this moment. But whatever you've chosen, you're now going to think about, okay, what do you value? What, how is it important for you to be in relation to this aspect of your life? You're gonna list at least three words that describe who you wanna be in regards to these things. And then you're going to do that third work once you look at your values, once you look at what you're bringing to the table in this part of your life, are they in line? And if not, what do you want to change to bring how you're living more in line with what you value? Next area of life. 
your emotional life. So I want you to take a moment to think about your relationship to your own emotional state, the way that you relate to other people's emotions, thinking about your friendships, thinking about intimacy in your life. And again, intimacy doesn't just mean partner intimacy. Intimacy is, you know, an honest, vulnerable conversation you share with a friend. Any way in which you're emotionally, or empathy, you're emotionally connecting to another person or you're relating to your own emotional self, right? How do you live the emotional aspect of life? How do you relate to other people's emotions? How do you relate to your own? And then you're going to think about your values. And they're likely going to be very different words in each aspect of life. And then you know where we're going by now. You're going to look at your values. You're going to think about how you live this part of your life, how you relate to your own and others' emotions. and think about what changes you'd like to make. You know, how do you relate to your own fears or joys? How do you relate to the fears and joys of others? To your personality? Frustrations. And what changes do you want to make? Okay. We have two more. And as you can tell, we're moving a bit more from the concrete to uh, more of the immaterial. So from emotion, we're going to move to the intellectual aspect of life and communication and self-expression. So I've given some examples to make this more concrete, but we can think of this as the aspect of life that contains such endeavors as artistic and creative endeavors. So how do you express yourself creatively? How do you engage your creative self? What are your intellectual pursuits? So outside of the things you have to do for work, outside of your tasks, what are you doing to nourish or nurture your intellect? And how do you communicate your ideas and your perceptions to other people? And how do you receive the ideas and the perceptions and the opinions of others? Right? And so we're thinking about the creative, intellectual, that inner world. How do you express it and how do you receive it? And what do you do to nourish it? So take some time to think about what this could look like for you. What it does look like for you. And then what is important, so what are your values in regards to your creativity, your intellect, and the exchange of ideas with other people? And now think about this. These this may be one. It often can be that when we get busy, we don't think about as much.
So take some time here to think about what does this aspect of your life look like and what do you want it to look like and what's important. And once you've identified that, what changes would you like to make in your life to live it more in line with your values? Okay. Moving us right along. Spiritual life. So spiritual life, this is one that is harder to define than the others in the sense that it's very personal. The examples that I've used are expressions of virtue and growing in awareness. But what I'm going to do is present those three questions and just give you an opportunity to think about it. What, what does spiritual mean for you? What does that look like? What's that comprised of? And again, that each of these slides could be a whole conversation, but for now, just thinking about what is this part of your life and how do you live it? And then what are your values? What's important to you in this part of life? Right, we can also think about spiritual part of life as humanism, a connection to others, ethics, those things that go beyond the individual. What's important for you here? And then that last question, are you living this aspect of your life in line with these values? And if not, what changes would you like to make? So at this point, I'm hoping that everyone has had an opportunity to think through all five of these aspects of life. Again, it's work you can continue to do on your own, but for today, what I'd like you to do is reflect on the work we just did and thinking about, right, we're starting from this place of thinking about what is most important to you? What are your values? And from that, you're drawing your goal. So I want you to think over all five of those areas and identify which, which one jumped out to you most as something that you want to start taking action on now. And that one's going to be the goal that you're going to workshop with the SMART technique. And in workshopping it, what you're going to do is you're committing to it. So you're going to put it into a form that you can start taking action on it as soon as we end the seminar. So which one are you ready to take action on? Now, on that note of which one are you ready to take action on, there's a stages of change model that I think is really important for us to think about globally in regards to goal setting. Because one of the reasons that we're not successful with our goals, there's many reasons actually. One is because the goal wasn't actually aligned with something we value. So we just did it out of convention and it wasn't actually what we wanted or needed to be doing at that time. The other is because even if it was something or is something that we do wanna be doing at some point, we weren't ready to fully make that change, but we pushed ourselves into doing it anyway and weren't successful. And that can also come from a place if we didn't actually fully understand what the problem was or what the change needed to be that we need to take action on. And so we weren't successful. And so this model shows that process. And I like this graph in particular because it has the upward spiral in the middle, which shows that once you accomplish a goal, for example, once you start eating healthier, 
it, it's not like you never need to think about your nutrition ever again. We're constantly in a process of growth and change. And sometimes we may come back to what looks like the same place and feel like we're dealing with the same problems, but we are approaching it from a new perspective. We're constantly moving upwards through this cycle with greater and greater perspective and awareness. And so I want to look at this really quickly, um, just to give you a sense. So pre-contemplation, oh, let's go back. Pre-contemplation is where we are before we're aware that there's a problem or a change that needs to happen. And I like to say that this is where someone else is when you think they have a problem and they tell you, I don't have a problem. They're in pre-contemplation, usually with that problem, oftentimes, well, if we've identified something that actually needs to be changed. Um, but we are never in pre-contemplation because we're not aware of that. So it's before it's on our radar. Contemplation is when all of a sudden we start to go, yeah, I, hmm, I do need to take a look at this, or that is something that I keep doing that isn't going well, or I do want this to be better. Contemplation is it's in your awareness, but you're not quite ready to make a change, either because you're not fully aware of what the problem is, or you're aware of the problem, but the obstacles or the sacrifice you'd have to make to change it is greater than the benefit of changing it, to put it simply. Preparation is when you've identified, okay, it's time. It's time to make this change. It's something I really need to do for myself. And you start putting into place a lasting plan. Where we go wrong is when we're in contemplation, we don't go into preparation. We try and jump straight into action without preparing. And then we fall back into contemplation. So that preparation step is important. Giving yourself time to really sit with it, look at it, think about it, and commit to it. Once you've done that, you're in action. So this is where you are eating the five fruits and vegetables, or you're working out every day, or whatever it is. You're doing it. You're implementing it. You're taking action. Maintenance is once you've done that for a certain amount of time, it's no longer a novel goal. It's something you're trying to incorporate into your life. It, it, you're really trying to make it a habit. This is often the difficult time. And then we have this relapse, which I don't love the word relapse because it implies you didn't get anywhere. What we're going to say is that you transcend a part of it, right? You're trying to maintain, but let's say all of a sudden you get a new piece of information or your environment or life changes. And how you were living that goal is either no longer relevant or it's been disrupted or you need to make a change. Something's going to happen that's going to take that habit and cause it to again enter this spiral. But that's how we grow. And that's how you learn. And every time you do it, it's going to become something that's a bit healthier and a bit more ingrained. And that's what we're working to do. So with the one you picked today, I'm going to ask you to pick something that you're in preparation with. Because if you're in contemplation, there's a bit more work that's going to need to be done to turn it into a SMART goal. To make this more concrete, um, just to summarize what I was saying, what you're going to do is you're going to take your change you identified. So let's say your change is, I want to be more, well, the one I'm going to use actually is I want to improve my relationships. So let's say I was going through those five areas of life and I was thinking about how I relate to others emotionally. And I was thinking, I want to improve my relationships. That's what's most important to me right now. So you're going to take your change and you're going to write one sentence about why it's this one that you're choosing out of all the things you could be taking action on, why this one? And then once you've done that, you're gonna write a sentence about the stage of change that you're in in relation to your goal. Now, again, I'm hoping you're in preparation. And if you are, then you'll be able to answer the question, why is now the time to change? But if you're feeling like you're in contemplation, and if you're not with this goal, but you are with others that you identified on your list, take some time to think about what are you waiting for, or what do you need to overcome, or what, what is it that is making this contemplation that you need to transform it into preparation. 
So ideally, right, you've chosen something in your preparation, but if you do this work outside of this workshop, that's a way to help you move from contemplation to preparation. And that's oftentimes what we do in coaching is grow an awareness around, okay, what's, what are all the pieces that are going into this? What's holding you back? Why are you in contemplation? And what does it look like to move and start taking action? Because oftentimes we don't really know the answer until we sit and intentionally reflect. So ideally now you have your goal, which is your change. You have a sentence about why this is the one that you're choosing and you have a sentence about why now. Okay. So as promised, we've looked at the why, we've talked about the what. So now we're going to look at the how, and this is the smart part. So to start, this presentation is called Smart Goals, but they're actually technically smart objectives in the sense that a goal is a broad destination of, like we can see, I want to be physically healthier. I want to awaken my creativity, right? But the objective is what are you going to do to implement that? What are you going to take, do to take action? So for example, I'm going to work out three times a week, become physically healthier, or I'm going to take art classes and play guitar to awaken my creativity. So we're going to be setting SMART objectives. And there could be more than one objective per goal. Awakening your creativity, you could see in that second example, there could be many ways to do that. But what we're going to focus on is one primary objective for the goal that you chose. There we go, okay. So the SMART, SMART can stand for a few things. The one that I am using it to stand for today is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. We're gonna go through each one of those and expand upon what that means and how it could apply to your goal. I'm going to workshop a goal with you to show you what this process looks like. So like I said, let's say I was going through, I was thinking about my emotional relationships and I realized that my values in my relationships are empathy, connectedness, and trust. And my goal, because I'm realizing my relationships aren't in line with those values, right? They don't, they don't contain those things. I wanna improve my relationships. That's my goal. And I'm intentionally choosing something that's outside of the material to show how this process can be applied to things that aren't just around weight and diet and you know checkbox type things and can really relate to your life. Okay, so I'm gonna read you this slide. Um, I wrote it all down because I think this is very, very important. Specific, in a nutshell, specific is just what exactly are you going to do? But to figure that out, you have to define the action you're going to take by getting to the heart of the problem. So like we said in that last part of the seminar, if your goal is I wanna improve my relationship, you have to think about what are you bringing to the table? What, what that you have control over has been preventing good relationships or has been holding you back from living them with as much empathy, trust, connectedness as you want. And the answer is always going to come from something within you, right? Because we're looking for something you can control, otherwise you can't change it and you can't set a goal around other people's behaviors. But as you do this, this is where it's really important to practice humility, both in the sense of having the courage to fully look at yourself, but also in the sense of not looking at yourself and going, I'm a terrible person, right? I'm, I never listen to people. I'm the, like, we're trying to just kind of keep it reasonable. So practicing humility and self-compassion, None of us is perfect. And this is very true as you do this work, because this work is a spiral itself. As you set goals and you grow and you learn about yourself, right? You're going to look at yourself and grow in awareness. You're gonna to have to look at yourself objectively 
but the more that you can do that and really see yourself as you are and see what you're bringing to the table, the more equipped you are to take responsibility for your own happiness because you can see how you can take ownership of all of these areas of your life. So it's really important to be honest with yourself in your specific steps. And once you've discovered it, you're going to make the solution positive. So for example, in relationships, right? If I think about, okay, how have my relationships been the last month? Oof, well, every time I call somebody, I just complain about how awful my life is and then I hang up. Ugh, okay, good to know, I see it, it's on the table. You can say, all right, what's been keeping me from living in line with my values is, well, I'm spending most of my conversations with others complaining, right? And it's been tough, you know, year, it makes sense. I am passionate about it, but I'm also real about it. That's what's been happening and that's what I've been doing and it's important to acknowledge it. So there are two ways to respond. Well, there's lots of ways, but two main ways you could respond to that awareness. One is a negative solution. All right, well, I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna stop being a complainer. I'm gonna stop being lazy. I'm gonna stop. But what that creates is a fight with yourself where you're just trying to not be something. So instead of making it negative, I'm gonna not do something, you're going to find a way to make your goal, your objective, positive. So for example, in this scenario, all right, well, in my, in my conversations, I'm gonna really focus on listening to and showing kindness towards others. So every conversation I have, I'm gonna prioritize those two things. Now, some of you may be thinking that's not specific enough yet, and you're correct, and we're gonna dig into that a little bit more, but we know now, I can at least say, okay, I know what my action is, I know how I'm gonna work in my relationships, it's by kindness and empathetic listening, and it's gonna take place in my conversation. We've identified the objective. So I'm gonna give you more time to workshop your goal, objective, objective goal, after we go through each of these slides. So for now, let the thoughts start to happen, but don't actually dig in and workshop your objective quite yet because there'll be time for it and all of this will be on the slide so you can refer back to it. Uh, something else to think about, if your objective is something like eating, right, changing your eating patterns and to stop eating sugar, I would still try and focus on how you could make that positive. Like I will go a whole day having only eaten fruits and vegetables. Again, just because the more that you can make it positive, the more you're celebrating instead of just waiting to fail. When you make it negative, you're just waiting to fail. I'm gonna not do something, I'm gonna not do something. Oh, I did it. And that doesn't feel as good as I did it. I went a whole day and I only ate fruits and vegetables. That's more positive. So as you're workshopping yours, think about that. Measurable. So think about the units you're going to use to measure your objective. They can be pounds, hours, items, events, etc. Straightforward example, inputs, um, considering inputs versus outputs. So things you can control versus things you can't. Inputs are what you do. So the vegetables you eat, the numbers of times, you work out. Outputs are pounds lost, inches on waistline, how calm you feel, how someone else responds to a conversation. There are things you can't control. And if you try and measure your objective by those, you'll be disappointed because you, have, you, you don't necessarily know. It can be interesting to look at, but you want to set your objective around your inputs. So in my example, my unit, my measurable unit is a phone call and a frequency. So I will call one person once a day and focus on listening to and showing kindness towards them during the conversation. Okay, attainable. So like I said, this objective is specific, but there's more that we could add to it. But this is a, this is a slippery slope area because it's important to think about everything that goes into your objective. I'm using the word attainable to mean thinking about, okay, what are all the things that I have to do to make sure that this objective, that I can put this into practice? To give you an example, 
right? In this example, I want to improve my relationships. I'm going to call someone once a day. And I said, I'm going to focus on listening to and being caring. Okay. What does that mean, listening to and being caring? Now, on the one hand, it's important to spend a little bit of time defining and digging in. Like if it's, I'm going to go through a personalized exercise routine, you want to know what that means. What is a personalized exercise routine? What, what are all the steps that are required to really flesh that out? But on the other hand, if it is a, an objective that's more like this, like listening to and being caring, you don't want to get too intellectual with it because you risk then making your emotional life a checklist and it's no longer sincere. So what I wrote here is, okay, thinking about how do I, how do I attain this state of listening and empathy and connectedness? Well, I can attain that by thinking about who do I want to connect to and making sure that I'm reaching out to those people. And I can attain that by reading a book on nonviolent communication and reflecting on how I'm using those principles in my conversation. Right, but, it, and that's gonna help me be able to attain this goal and it's going to mean that I can definitely do it because now I really know what that means. I know what I'm doing. I am using nonviolent communication strategies with others. But you'll see, I didn't turn my whole objective into I'm gonna call someone and implement nonviolent communication strategies because then I've lost, you know, I've lost the forest for the trees in a sense. I've lost the spirit and the whole thing is how do I live more empathetically? So don't get too detail oriented and lose the spirit of your objective, but also make sure that you are very clear about what it is that you're doing and that you have all the pieces in place to be able to do it. And because each person's objective is different, it's hard for me to speak to all of them, but I'm hoping this is general enough to give you an idea in the attainable of what are all the different things that go into doing that fully. That's what I recommend doing with the attainable steps. All the steps around that objective, all the little steps. Realistic. So this is where it's important to think about, are you setting yourself up for success or are you being too hard on yourself or are you being too easy on yourself? Usually it's the too hard on ourselves um, because we've identified this and it's gonna be important to you and it feels like, oh man, I should have been doing this forever or it's really important so I'm gonna do it 150%. But if you haven't been doing it, be kind to yourself because you're building new habits, you're building neuroplasticity, you're building new neural connections. So aim low to set yourself up for success and then increase the challenge like anything else you would do. Like when you learn guitar, you don't, you know, go in learning how to play classical string, whatever. You go in learning how to play a chord, maybe even just a string. So you're trying to do that with your objective. So with mine, I originally had, I'm going to call someone every single day and be the best listener ever. I've dropped it down to, I'm going to call two people a week. And I'm going to focus on that listening and that kindness. And I'm going to use those nonviolent communication strategies to do that. Okay. So it looks like we're at our last one here, which is time bound. Time bound is very straightforward, but it is important, very important, not to forget this step. What it offers you is an opportunity to celebrate. And it may seem silly, but psychologically, it's very important to building self-directedness, which, as we said, is the, the guiding um, principle for all of this. It's important because it reaffirms to yourself and to your brain, I can do it. I can do what I set out to do, and I can be successful. And so you want to make that time-bound aspect not too, too long. Like, I'm going to call two people and be kind forever. You know, and that might be your ultimate goal, but for your objective, give yourself a window. And at the end of that window, take some time to reflect and to think about how it went and to think about what you learned. And then you could do the exact same thing for another four weeks, but always put an end time on it and a reasonable one. 
And if for a reasonable, I usually mean, depending on the objective, no more than four weeks if it's something that you're trying to turn into a habit. And even two weeks, actually, if it's something that you haven't been doing for a long time. And even a week if it's really a challenge. So this is where you workshopping your objective comes in. As you can see, I have put up workshop your goal. My values, so this is, these are all my examples, my values, right? And then realizing that they're not as present in my relationships as I want them to be. So I want to improve my relationships. The problem or the obstacle that's been in the way of me living that has been that I complain in most of my conversations and it's really about me and my negative experiences and that's all I'm doing. I'm not leaving that space for genuine connection and I want to change that. So how am I going to do that? Smart. Let me do that in a smart way. And you can see all the steps and their impact on my objective and how they changed it down the line. So I'm going to give you a few minutes here. I'm going to play a little bit of music. It's um, self-work time to look at your objective. And I'm really going to encourage you to dig deep and to go through each one of these steps so that by the end of this time, you have an objective that you're ready to take action on by the end of this seminar. If anyone has questions, um, you can type the question, and this might be a time to do it, but I really would encourage you to use this time for self-work, but if there's something that's getting in the way of your ability to workshop your objective, then please feel welcome to type your question, and I will figure out how to respond to it. But I'm going to mute myself and turn on the music for the work.
we're going to move on to the next slide here. Um, so hopefully that gave you an opportunity to work on your own objective. And I'm hoping by now you have an objective that you're ready to take action on. Before you do, there are a few things to keep in mind. And just to let you know, we may run a few minutes over. This will be recorded and available um, in the Palm database. So if you have to go right at 4.30 and you'd like to see the end, you can find it there. But it's important to think about obstacles because we're going to face them. No matter what the goal is, you're going to run into obstacles. And as Leonardo da Vinci said, not to foresee them is already to moan. Meaning if you didn't see it coming, you're already setting yourself up to be uncomfortable by the fact that it's gonna happen and you didn't think about it. So it's really important to be realistic with what you can expect when you start to try and take, take action on this goal. So I'm breaking obstacles into three categories and it's an oversimplification to some extent, but it can help you think about the nature of the obstacles you might face with your objectives. One is environmental resources. So let's say you wanna take action on your mental health and you wanna start seeing a therapist and you live out in rural um, Missouri, and there are very few therapists or psychiatrists available to help with that goal of working on your mental health. And even more, you might want to, let's see, whatever it might be, right, we're always faced with this question of how many resources are available to help us with that. And this is where I recommend getting very creative, especially now with everything being so virtual, there is likely a support group and a support resource of some form to help you with your objective, regardless of what it is. So research, 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 you may be surprised what you find. Meetup groups I know are still very active in St. Louis and meetup groups are groups that come together purely to work on certain uh, common goals and common shared interests. So if you wanna learn French, there's a French group. If you wanna go cycling, there's a cycling group. So really spend some time figuring that out. Personal resources, this can be tricky. Uh, time and money are almost always what I hear as being the two obstacles people have to taking action on their health. And I understand that. And especially with things having been so uncertain for a lot of people recently, it's even harder. But it's really important to sit down with yourself and think about what you have and what you need. So if the one thing standing in your way of taking action on something is the time or the money, think about how are you spending those resources? How are you spending your time? How are you spending your money? Because we can almost always find the time for something that's critically important. It just takes reprioritizing. So again, you may find that you, you can't or you don't, or you don't have the resources, but really take some time and be honest with yourself there. And then social resources, reach out for help, engage your network, engage the meetup group network, engage other people that share that interest and that want to see you grow and want to see you flourish because that's going to help keep you motivated and it's also gonna connect you to things that are gonna help you even more with your goal that you may not have known about. Like for mine, maybe there's a, another, you know, nonviolent communication support group or something that I could connect to and we could talk about how our conversations are going. So, so really get engaged with your network. The internal obstacles, um, we all know these, right? You have to be honest with yourself about what you can change and what you can't. So if you're very shy and if one of the reasons that you have been complaining on your phone calls is because it's easier than being emotionally honest with the person on the phone or putting yourself in a position to hear how they're doing honestly because it, it feels emotionally uncomfortable, you have to be honest with yourself about that. And it's probably still gonna be hard, right? But you, if you can acknowledge it and go, okay, I'm shy, it's hard for me to put myself out there, but it's really important for me to start to do so so I'm gonna do it anyway, you're going to be more successful than I'm gonna do it. And then all of a sudden you feel shy and it derails you from moving forward. So the more honest you can be with who you are and what strengths you have and what weaknesses you have, the more successful you'll be. 
old habits and momentum. So this is the, every time I come home, I jump straight on the couch and turn on TV. And now I want to start working out every night, you know, when I get home. But gosh darn, if my body doesn't just go straight to that couch and lie down. And, and we build neuroplasticity. We build neural networks that reinforce certain patterns of thought and certain behaviors. And so if you're trying to implement an objective that takes you out of those thoughts and behaviors, you can expect those old momentums are going to come up as you try to do that. And so this is where it's really important to just keep on keeping on and reinforce those good habits. And eventually you're gonna reprogram those thoughts and behaviors, but in the beginning it's gonna be very hard. So for that, an accountability buddy, so someone you check in with every few days and you say, I did it, I did it, I didn't, or I didn't, and I'm putting it out there and I'm gonna start doing it again. Someone who is watching more than just you, right? In a compassionate way, but also is holding you accountable. Checklists are a really good way to do this. And at the end, we do have some resources here that I think are really good. I'll show you at the end if you wanna stay. We have some checklists and some journals that essentially ask you every day to be honest with yourself about how you did. And that's gonna help transform those habits and momentums. And then the inner critic, this is that part of yourself that tells yourself you can't do it, you didn't deserve to do it, you shouldn't do it. All those things that we have carried with us for most of our lives. Um, this is where it's important to recognize it, recognize when it's coming up and let it go. And there are a lot of resources here that can help you with that, um, that voice that holds you back from changing. The last thing I want to mention is what do you do when the completely unexpected happens and you're trying to make a change and then all of a sudden your car breaks down and active nature occurs, someone needs help, there's a sudden change in finances, political or societal changes, right? You're living a certain way, you feel good about it. And this is something I wrote two years ago, but all of a sudden there's a complete shift in this fabric of society. How do you, how do you respond and how do you keep taking action on what's important to you? So I have an answer and I don't at the same time. What I would say to this is this is where these traits, so self-directedness, but some related traits of resilience and self-actualization are, are important to think about. Resilience I'm defining as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or stress, right? So this is a, I get knocked down, but I get up again spirit. Self-actualization is the achievement of your potential through creativity, independence, spontaneity, and a grasp of, the, grasp of the real world. And this is someone who has the vision and has the resilience to no matter how much they get knocked off course, they're back on and they're heading towards that value and that virtue and that thing that's important for them. And I put four examples of that, Helen Keller, Mahatma Gandhi, Florence Nightingale, Martin Luther King Jr people who we know about because their ability to continue in the face of adversity and the clarity of their intention was so strong that they became models for other people. These are the things we're trying to cultivate in ourselves. And so the goal, really a goal, a SMART goal is one example of you putting this whole process into motion of defining your objective, defining your values and moving towards it and not letting yourself get derailed, right? That's what the SMART goal is, like the, the little part of the path, but the path is made up of a lot of SMART goals and a lot of self-exploration. So at Palm, if you are a Palm member, um, we have a number of resources to help you with this whole process for to build resilience, to build self-directedness, and to just hold you accountable. If you feel like you know what you want to do and you just want someone to be there for you as an accountability buddy, I recommend starting with the well-being and stress assessment. It's going to be an hour with one of us, the well-being coaches, to figure out what's 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 going on, what's everything that's going on in your life, and try and get to the heart of what is causing the stress and where do you want to go and how can we start to think about the path 
that's going to bring you there, right? It's kind of like doing the work that we did before, but very personalized to you. And it takes the place of a conversation where we just, we're really gonna help you look at all those, all those things. So once we do a well-being and stress assessment, then we'll make recommendations for the following. Well-being coaching with the Know Yourself series is an intensive, um, very in-depth curriculum that asks you these bigger questions. I drew the material that I'm using from that curriculum. It's, it's a multi um, DVD series. So essentially you're doing a unit where you're learning about yourself. You're learning about those obstacles. You're learning about the inner critic. You're learning techniques and tools to keep going. That's one of the most comprehensive programs that we have. The stress management program is also a comprehensive program where you do some counseling, some psychiatry, some art. It's to help look at all the different aspects of your goals, your motivations, the things that hold you back, the inner critic, all of it to become a bit more fluid. And it also helps manage stress if stress is really what feels like weighing you down. We have health coaching, which is a good option for accountability. You know what you want to do. You just want someone to hold you accountable cardiac coherence in the TCI, deep breathing to calm the emotions. So you can keep focusing on what's important, the TCI, to learn about your emotions and how they contribute to those inner obstacles, um, but also to your strengths. Neuroplasticity, like we talked about, transforming the brain. It's a class that we do to help build that. Meditation, for becoming aware of your thoughts. And then these journals that I talked about, which I actually have an example of here. Um, and you don't have to use these at all. But the idea is any support that you use, this is a habit tracker. It's super simple. And you could use a journal and you could just check off your goals. But you want some form of external something to hold you accountable so that you're not just keeping it on your head. Like, yeah, I think I did pretty well this week. You want to look at it. So whether you use one of these resources, whether you write it down in a journal, whether you make yourself a color-coded Excel sheet, hold yourself accountable visually so that you're objective. So that um, concludes this presentation. I finished with this quote because, like I said, this is a snapshot, one part of the larger process, which is your life. And your SMART goals are a part of what continue to move you forward on this journey, but it's, it's ongoing and it's never ending. And as Plato said, it's a combination of doing your work and knowing yourself. And each of those is going to deepen the other. So the more you take action, the more you'll know yourself. And the more you know yourself, the more you'll know the action you want to be taking. And as Gandhi said in the beginning, we are with each step moving ourselves further along the path of who we want to become and what's important to us. So I hope that this was helpful. Um, again, it will be recorded. You can always come back to it if it's something that you want to revisit with a new goal. And I will stay for about five minutes if there's any further questions. Um, but otherwise, I wish you all the best in implementing your SMART objectives.